I think we don't have the official name of the lecture uh, on the syllabus, but I thought maybe what unified these things is that they're all about continuous time quantum computation or um, sort of looking at computation using the Hamilton. So um, first we're going to talk about the simulation algorithm for the efficient simulation of quantum systems using the quantum computer. And then we'll talk about the model computation called the really bad model, which um, uses uh, the slowly changing Hamiltonian to perform the computation. And we'll discuss how you can understand the runtime of algorithms in that model, how it can be simulated in a circuit model, and how um, it can actually simulate the circuit model. So that's, that's the plan. So I'm going to start with uh, the algorithm for the simulation of quantum dynamics. So here, here we, our starting point is the Schrodinger equation. And let's imagine that um, we would like to simulate the evolution of some physical system uh, according to the Schrodinger equation for some amount of time. So to be a little bit more specific, so this is uh, our Hamiltonian, of course, and we are going to consider uh, k-local Hamiltonians, just like um, Dorit was talking about earlier. Local. Um, and I also want to, in general, consider the case where h could be time-dependent. So this equation is true, um, you know, it, it describes uh, the evolution of a physical system, uh, and in the case where H is time dependent, you can imagine like someone has an experiment in the lab, and maybe describes some atoms in some kind of um, trap, and they can turn some knob, which is the magnetic field, and that changes the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is sort of the interactions that the system experiences, and so you could imagine that changing as a function of time. But the Schrodinger equation still describes the time evolution of the system, and over here, h would just depend on time. Um, okay. I also want to, uh, as before, establish some notation for its eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So remember that it's an image and operator, so its eigenvalues of lambda j are real, and I'm writing alpha j for an orthonormal basis uh, of eigenvectors. And um, we know that. Uh, in the case, so I said that I'm going to care about the case where H is time independent, time dependent, but for um, for the next short while, I'm going to consider the case where it's time independent. And in that case, we know the solution of this equation. So if H of T is H of T is zero, so it's time independent, then the solution is just given by Okay, so this is the solution to the Turing equation. Starting in a state psi of zero, evolving for time t, you can verify that it satisfies this equation. Here, this is the matrix exponential function. So you can think of this as being defined by its Taylor series. Or, if you like, you can expand psi of zero in a complete basis of eigenstates, so in this basis of eigenstates, and then um, and then you can imagine this acting as e to the minus lambda j t within each eigenstate. Okay. So this is the solution to the Schrodinger equation. So now the question that I want to consider is um, how hard is it to solve the Schrodinger equation? Okay. So let's say you want to do this on a classical computer. So let, let's say we're talking about Hamiltonians on n spins that are k-local. So how, how would you do it? I mean, what, what do you think is the right uh, you know, cost for that in the past? Okay. So let, let's think about this for a second. So, so this, if we're talking about a Hamiltonian on n qubits, then how, how big is this vector? Uh, yes, it's a blank two to the end. So it's somehow like the problem itself. If I ask you to actually produce the vector psi of t, 
and of course you have to use at least you know, space to the end. But I could ask other questions, like I could ask you, for example, I could tell you that psi of zero is a product state, like all zero, and then I could tell you to produce for me, um, you know, the expected value of some observable after evolving for some time t. So for example, I could ask you, you know, what's the expected value of the sigma z for the z poly operator on the first qubit after time t. So then what do you think is the uh, classical complexity of that? You know, you have to get. <laughs> What's that? Oh, Lancho's algorithm? Yeah, so I think um, basically what you're saying is you would apply some linear algebra algorithm in this large space, the size 2 to the n, and then compute the expected value. And I think to a good approximation, that is, um, you know, we can't do much better than that. Um, so it is believed that one cannot simulate the Schrodinger equation even to answer questions like, to the expected value after some time t, um, one can't do that efficiently uh, in pop, on, on a classical computer. In fact, if one could, then um, that would show that EQT is contained in EQT, and, uh, and we can expect that to be true. So, so this actually, this problem of simulating the Schrodinger equation, it's not just um, some computational complexity thing. Of course, you know, this is a problem in the real world because uh, systems like uh, molecules or materials, um, systems of dense matter physics, are described by the Schrodinger equation and computing certain properties, uh, certain computing time dynamics of such systems. You know that's that's this problem. And so Feynman in, in 1982, you know, asked the question: Is there a universal quantum simulator? And he was interested in using quantum system to simulate uh, Schrodinger time evolution of other quantum systems. And, um, and so Lloyd, Seth Lloyd, later in 1996, uh, described sort of a realization of that dream in the quantum circuit model. So what he showed is that on a quantum computer, you can efficiently simulate the time dynamics of a local Hamiltonian. And, um, and so that's what I want to show you in the first part of the section. So let me state the theorem. Okay, so it's going to be an efficient classical algorithm that produces a quantum circuit. Okay? The input is a precision parameter epsilon, some time for which you want to evolve, and the Hamiltonian, which is k-local, uh, let's say qubit, Hamiltonian on the qubit. And the output of this classical algorithm is going to be a quantum circuit. Which is the sequence of gates, and let's say that these gates are you know, one and two qubit gates, and the length of the gate sequence is polynomial in uh, let me, uh, so let me write the Hamiltonian as a sum of m local terms. These are k local terms. And um, I'm also going to assume that the norm, the operator norm of each term is the most one. Okay, so then, then the, the, the length of this gate sequence is polynomial in M, the evolution time, and the inverse approximation half. And the circuit has the feature that, so let's call this whole thing U, the product. So U minus E to the IHT as an operator is epsilon close. So in particular, you know, this implies that if I apply u to the state psi of zero, then I get psi of t up to that one. Okay, now, there's a 
few things to say about this before we go through the proof. One is that um, the algorithm that I present is not going to be optimal in any of the parameters. I mean, it's like, that's why I wrote the polynomial of M, T, and epsilon of inputs. Because, um, you know, this was from 1996, and over 22 years, there have been many improvements, even up to and including last year, maybe 2016, it was a major improvement. So for example, like, I'll just tell you what some of the improvements are. Actually, I should have maybe even, well, okay. One of the improvements is that, maybe I'll tell you about the improvements after I, I show you this algorithm. But the point is that, um, you know, this is enough to show that a quantum computer, a gate model quantum computer can simulate a local Hamiltonian um, but the complexity of that simulation has been improved over what I'll show you. Yeah. I think that's a very naive question, but it's sort of not obvious to me why the complexity of this problem is scaled with T. So oh. It's kind of weird because it, just because of the background kind of thing. It, uh, I mean, T is time, so of course it can take more time. But if I look at the, the IHT, it's not clear at all that I add. Or something, and it's the same. So why did it? Um, oh, what, what's the right scaling? Right? Yeah. Why would I expect such a? Well, the eigenvalues are yeah, so not integers. Right? No, I understand. I understand. I'm, 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 oh, you're asking about like a recurrence time, like you know, is there? For example, why is there not such a thing? Yeah, I mean, why is it? I understand also from property that you can do all these things. T comes into the picture, so I guess. See that right? I don't have the intuition to know why it is not good. Yeah. So, yeah, in fact, sometimes it is. You can sort of shortcut and get rid of it. But that's not. Uh, but, but it's not typical. And the reason it's not typical is because uh, we don't understand the eigenvectors. Yeah. So, and the eigenvalues, especially the eigenvectors. If we understood it, we could have computed the. Uh, the eigenvalue times t modulo t pi, and then that will say that uh, we don't understand how to do the computation with the eigenvectors. I, I'm not sure I have a better, I don't have any further comments. I, I don't have an intuition. Yes. Uh, how you said it's k local. How does Folly depend, how does it depend on k? Oh, how does it depend on k? Um, well, actually, what we're going to show is that I'm going to show you how it can be decomposed into k-local gates. Well, we know that any k-local gate can then, with constant overhead, be decomposed into two and one local gates. So that's where the extra cost for k will come from. Okay. Decomposing these as k-local gates into one and two. Actually, um, that brings me to a point. So, um, can anyone tell me, like, how do we do this if all the terms in the Hamiltonian commute? So let's say that my goal is to decompose into k local gates. Let's say all the terms commute into like, you know, h j commute with h k. Yeah. I, actually, I think I have an answer for tomorrow. Oh, okay. Uh, so if you could do this, if you could do the simulation less than t, then this means you can do it on a quantum computer. Now, this quantum computer runs in time less than t. So apply the same thing again to the Hamiltonian that describes this quantum computer. And less and less, it seems like this thing would allow you to sort of squeeze anything yeah. into like uh, constant time, right? That seems that seems too good. I mean, I'm, I'm, your question is based off the break, like what you're sort of looking for formula. Yeah, it's just that like, it's a simple theory, it's just a t there. Like, why can I try to do the computation and multiply it by t or something? So I, I, don't know. I mean, I understand it. Yeah, so yeah. Oh, it's okay. You can do it like constant, right? Yeah. Okay, well, maybe I can continue. So, so the challenge is basically that, and, and this is important not to make this mistake, is that e to the minus iht is not equal to the product of these guys for the individual terms in general. So this would be true if all the guys, if all these hj's commuted, then this would be true for the quality, but generally that's not true. If, if this was true, like if, all, if they all commuted, then this would already be a decomposition into k local gates because each h sub j is itself k local, and so then you could go ahead and decompose each of these individually into one and two local gates. But the challenge is that that's not generally true, and so now we have to think about how we're going to decompose 
uh, you, you know, even though this isn't true. And so, like, he, one small observation is that it's sort of approximately true if these, if these terms have small norms. So, for example, if you have E to the I A to the I B minus E to the I and then the sum, let's say that A and B are, their norms are bounded by some primary delta. Then this is order delta squared. Now, how do you how do you show this? So the way you show it is you expand each of these as a Taylor series to first order, and the second order term gives you delta squared. So delta squared, and then do the same thing with the other two terms. Okay. So this is. Um, Little fact, and we're going to need one more fact, and then from those two facts, we're going to include uh, this theorem. The second fact is actually sort of useful generally for analyzing quantum circuits. Um, so it says the following thing Suppose that you have a set of unitary operators being one through and then another set of W1 and WM. And let's say we imagine that you know V1 through VM is like a quantum circuit, and W1 through WM are like approximations to the gates in the circuit. Okay? So then you can ask like how well does the product of the Vs approximate the product of the Ws? And how well, you know how close are they? So the what the number says is that if I take the operating norm of V1 and V2 M, Minus um, this is at most the sum so if each of these gates is close to each of these gates then um, then the difference of these you know, products of the gates would be uh, bounded by the sum of the gates so we're going to use those two facts, and we're going to prove uh, this theorem. Oh, uh, to prove this is quite simple. I mean, let's just do the case m equals two. And actually, if you do the case m equals two, then the general case follows by an inductive argument, just taking, for example, you know, if you take this to be v one and this to be v two, and do induction. So the case m equals two. Um, Right. So this is equal to minus W one two plus this. So the argument is triangular inequality. So now I'm taking the operator and I'm going to have a unitary acting on the right, and here I have a unitary acting on the left, and those just go away. Okay. So those are our two little facts, and now from those we can prove this uh, how do you know prove this thing? Okay. Maybe it's, would it be all right if I erase the statement of the theorem as we proved? No? Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, can I erase this? Okay. Yeah, okay. So the first thing is that we're going to take this e to the minus i h t and we're going to divide it up into segments. Of some much shorter length of time. Okay? So divide by r and take it to the power r. Now these operators obviously, you know, r is just some numbers, so these operators all can be the diagonal and not many basis of h. So this power, you know, and I can just compose this to this one. And I'm going to take actually r to be a quarter 
compute p squared over epsilon for reasonable c light. So these are some short segments. And for each segment, we can use this. Um, uh, so for one segment, we can use this uh, lemma one, because on one segment, we have the operator norms of all the terms in H are very small. Okay, so lemma one says that dBIA dIB is approximately dBIA plus B in the small operator norm. And so here we have E to the I times the sum of terms of small operators. And we can uh, actually recursively use that lemma, which involves only two terms at a time, to get a bound on uh, the following quantity. Okay, so this just follows from a recursive application of that first lemma where we had, um, uh, you know, e to the i to the c is approximately e to the i to the i p. But now, what we said is that this this operator we're trying to approximate can be written as a product of these gates, and each of those gates is well approximated by this sequence. So now we can use this this planning, which says when we have a product of gates and we can approximate each gate individually. Then we can approximate. <coughs> okay. So we're going to apply. Um, now we're going to apply claim two, which states that Okay, so um, let's see. Put the extra power of n here. So, so here what I did is I said each of the gates in this product is well approximated by this up to this error. So now when I take the product of R of those gates, I pick up, oh sorry, I pick up an extra factor of, of R. So here I have one of R squared, here I have one of R. Okay? So this, this is now exactly the decomposition we want, because this is the unitary u, or this is e to the minus iht, and this is going to be our u that approximates it, and it is explicitly written as a product of k local gates. Okay? And now if we wanted to, we could decompose those into one and two local gates. And with our choice of r, um, this is at most order epsilon. Okay? So we approximated the the unitary and the operating on or epsilon. All right, so that's sort of like the most basic version of Hamiltonian simulation. And now I, I want to comment on, um, well, this, this is quite, you know, inefficient, although it is an efficient algorithm. It's, it's not very practical. Um, the, what is the length of this gate sequence? Um, so the length of this gate sequence, we have R times M gates, and R is given by that, so this is like m to the 4 t squared over epsilon, right? Now, the best known algorithms for Hamiltonian simulation have a linear scaling with t, and actually a logarithmic scaling of 1 over epsilon. So the scaling of 1 over epsilon can be made logarithmic, and that was only shown, I think, in 2015. So that's a relatively recent development by Childs, Bolton, and so on. Um, so this is uh, not close to optimal, but it took something like 20, 20 years to get to the better algorithm. Uh, and those algorithms are obviously hard to present. Um, and you know, kind of conceptually, this algorithm illustrates the main point that I wanted to convey, which is that the continuous time quantum computation with the Hamiltonian is not more powerful than the circuit model. And so this shows that I can use the circuit model to simulate Hamiltonian, it's also true that I can simulate the quantum 
come up with this and then we'll that later. Okay, so let's move on to um, part two, which is about the bad Are there any questions about this? Well, if the class algorithm runs for exponential time, you can just solve the problem. I don't think it can run last couple exponential time, or it runs last couple for a number of time, then quantum for a number of time. But what if I want a small quantum circuit? So they're like, there's a trade of some of the quantum oh, trade trade off. to the classical part. So actually, there have been some. Uh, so, like, Robbie Smith and Smolin has done the question of, like, let's say you have an n qubit quantum computer, but you want to simulate an n plus one qubit quantum computer using classical, you know, code processing. And so, people have studied things like that. I think, specifically in the case of quantum simulation, I don't think there has been work. Um, but, like, for the, you know, in this setting. But, um, yeah, that paper I mentioned is from 2016, so it's not, uh, it's not a well studied area. Yes. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> okay. So, so we were talking just now about time independent Hamiltonians, but now I want to talk about um, slowly changing Hamiltonians. I'm going to allow the Hamiltonian to depend on time. And I, I'm going to define sort of a continuous time model of quantum computing. So now, like in the previous uh, section, we were talking about using a quantum computer to simulate everything that's out there to evolve in continuous time. And now I want to really imagine that I like, have a device, and that device evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, and I have some control over the Hamiltonian. And I want to understand what the power of that device. Okay. And um, oh, I should mention that what I'm going to talk about here is the model computation developed by Tardy, Goldstone, Gutman, and Sipser um, in 2000. Okay. So to tell you how this model computation is going to work, I need to just tell you sort of briefly a, a rough version of the idiomatic theorem in quantum mechanics. But then we're going to go into more detail and I'll tell you a rigorous version later. But just to get started, let's have like an informal version. Okay? So this is the informal version. And what it says is let's say I start the system here in the ground state of h at time t equals zero. And then I evolve. But I evolve in such a way that I only change the Hamiltonian very slowly. Like, think of this as like the limit of infinitely slowly. Okay? So now I get some final state after some time. And um, so Anyone want to guess what state it would be? The ground state, that's right, of the final Hamilton. So this is going to be the ground state of H of T. If, so this, this is sort of like, you know, in the limit where this change is slow. Okay? So this is the adiabatic theorem. It says that this is true in that way. So now you can imagine <coughs> using this to do a computation. I mean, we've talked about how. Um, it's hard to prepare ground state for Hamiltonians, but that's only for certain Hamiltonians. And you know, obviously there's some Hamiltonians where that ground state is very easy to prepare. And so you can imagine um, you know, trying to morph an easy to prepare ground state into a hard to prepare ground state. And that's the idea of adiabatic computing. Okay, so let me uh, just say it in the study. <coughs> So 
we're going to need some ingredients to solve the problem, right? So this is kind of like a meta algorithm in that it can be applied in, to various problems. So, so imagine that we want to solve some problem x. So what do we need? We need some family of local Hamiltonians parameterized, let's say, by one parameter that runs from 0 to 1. Uh, and we want the ground state of, at the beginning of the path to be easy to prepare. And then we want the ground state of the Hamiltonian at the end of the path. So let's say that when we measure it, it gives the solution to the problem we care about. And, um, and so these are sort of like the most basic ingredients for an idiopathic algorithm. And so then the algorithm, of course, is um, is that we uh, start in psi of zero, which is the ground state of h of zero. I'm going to be a little bit specific here. We're going to let s evolve according to a linear schedule. So here, s this parameter that morphs the easy Hamiltonian to the hard Hamiltonian, it goes from zero to one. So I'm going to choose s to be linear in time, as a function of time, and it's going to be over some total evolution time, uh, capital T, that we'll talk about in a moment. And then uh, the last step is, of course, you know, measure, uh, measure the final state to get the solution to the problem of the Okay, so this is like the meta algorithm, which is the adiabatic algorithm. Okay, so first of all, um, you know this can be simulated. So first of all, what is the you know the runtime of this algorithm is related to how big t needs to be so that this adiabatic theorem holds. Okay, so we're going to talk about that shortly. The runtime is this capital T. That's basically the cost of this algorithm. Okay, and we've been very non-specific about that so far. Um, an important thing is that this can be simulated on a universal quantum computer. So we talked about how to simulate um, time-independent Hamiltonians just a moment ago. If you have a slowly changing Hamiltonian, of course you can just break it up into segments over which it's approximately constant. Okay? And then use the, um, the standard uh, time-dependent Hamiltonian simulator we just talked about. So the, the cost on a universal quantum computer is also roughly proportionally linear. Um, so what we're going to need is we need a quantitative version of this adiabatic theorem that sort of gives us an error bound as a function of how long the evolution time is. Okay, and those exist in the literature. Um, but before before we before we do that, I want to just give an example of like you know a provocative example that was from the original paper on this, um, which shows you sort of maybe why this. Um, idea was at first controversial, and, um, and so you can keep this in mind as an example of like um, of, of one type of adiabatic algorithm. Sorry, does capital T depend on H? Yes, yes, it will need to depend on H. Okay, so, so let's do an example. So this is going to be like, let's say we try to solve a constraint satisfaction problem on like free side. Okay? So in the original paper, this was proposed as some kind of application of this algorithm. So let's consider a Hamiltonian which is uh, a linear interpolation between two Hamiltonians. Here, HB, so this, this is HP is the beginning Hamiltonian, that's H of zero. HP is the problem Hamiltonian, that's H of one. Okay. HB, we're going to take to just be uh, sum from H of one M, one minus XJ. So what's the ground state of that? This is H of zero. Mm -hmm. Can the ground state of this is? Let's say n was 1, what would be ground state? We just had one term. So if you had one term, it would be 1 minus x, 
And then the ground state would be the, what are the eigenvalues of x? The eigenvalues are plus one and minus one. So the ground state would be the um, plus one eigenvector of x, right? The plus state. And now if I have n of them, all those operators commute. So the ground state is the plus state on all the two. So the ground state, um, Plus. Right, so that's the ground state of this kind of time. Obviously, that's very easy to prepare. Okay? This is just decoupled spins. They don't talk to one another. Now we can define this problem Hamiltonian. And let's say we consider the case where it's diagonal in the computational basis and it computes, um, uh, it computes the number of violated clauses for some string satisfaction problem. Okay, so I'm not being very specific here because obviously this could be applied to many different constraint satisfaction problems, but imagine for example three SAT. And this HP would be a three local Hamiltonian. In fact it's just the one that Dorit constructed in his lecture uh, yesterday. Okay? So this is this these ingredients together, we've got all the ingredients we need. You know, because if you measure the ground what is the ground state of this Hamiltonian, it's the satisfying assignment. To the instance of three sat. So this we have you know, all the ingredients for an adiabatic quantum algorithm for three sat. And um, of course, you know, we don't believe that quantum computers can solve problems like this and be thinking problems in fundamental time. So it has to be that on an example like this, if that's true, it has to be that the amount of time, this capital T in this example, has to be scaling at least exponential with n. One kind of interesting thing is that um, Maybe I'll just give a teaser for the next portion of the talk. This was proposed like in 2000, and um, the, the, the bounds on this T have not been proven to exclude, you know, to, to show that this is, has to be exponential. So somehow, even though we sort of understand, you know, what this T is in terms of the Hamiltonian, it seems to be very hard to compute in specific examples such, such as this. Even though we think that it should be excellent, um, um, and there are some arguments for that, um, we're unable to prove it in the original examples that were proposed. Okay. So that brings me to. So let me pause if there are any questions about this sort of general framework and the model. Yes? How could we avoid a uh, level crossing or possible damage in this process? Yeah, well, so I, I kind of glossed over that. So. If the ground state becomes degenerate at some point, then you will have a level crossing. And then you have to be a little bit more careful than I'm going to be. But uh, I don't want to be careful about that in this lecture, because that's what happened as an engineer. Most of the time, that won't happen. Yes? Um, it should some of the cost of the algorithm be in how difficult it is to uh, make a system with that Hamiltonian? Well, no, because not really, because um, because we can simulate it on a universal quantum computer. So you can think of this if you like as a way to design algorithms for universal quantum computer. You know, it's like random walk. Nobody is building these like systems of little tiny walkers that you know. But but on the other hand, it's a useful framework for designing algorithms, right? And so like that's one way to think about data back. Yes. So your last comment, you're saying basically we have an upper bound on T in terms of H, but not a lower bound. That's what would be. That's what would be ideal. Um. On capital T. Well, actually, in most cases, we can prove neither an upper or a lower bound. So right now, you're going to show that capital T is fine. I'm going to show it's related to some parameter of H that is well studied. <laughs> What is the, the lower bound? The, the lower bound on the, on the T? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't think that there is any useful lower bound. Okay. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do is tell you, so now we really need this adiabatic theorem, right? which is going to tell us how big T needs to be.
So there's I should mention this is, as I said, kind of a folklore term. There are many versions in the literature. And the one that I'm going to quote is from Jensen, Ruskin, and Siler, and I'll I'll write the names down in a moment. Um, so, so we have this Hamiltonian, it depends on the parameter S. I'm going to assume, I think I need to assume that it's continuously differentiable or has two degrees, two different, two derivative, two, it's, it's somehow smooth, like there's two, I forget what the exact statement is, but two continuous derivatives or something like that um, for the thing that we're about to send. Um, so we have this Hamiltonian path, it's relatively smooth. Um, so do you assume that the H is one of the H's with the real? No, 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 they, they definitely don't. Yeah. So like, in this example, it, it must be. Um, so I'm going to write the eigenvalues as a function of x, okay? So actually I'm going to assume for now, it's not really necessary, but I will assume that the um, ground state is unique. <coughs> Okay, so this is the ground energy. This is the first extended energy as a function of s. Okay? And likewise, we have um, you know, the eigenstates. Actually, I'm only really going to care about the ground state. I'll write that as alpha zero of s. And the thing that's going to be, well, there's two things that are going to determine the performance of this algorithm. And one is sort of unimportant, and the other one is very difficult and is very important. And the unimportant one, is going to be, I'm going to assume there's some upper bound, which I'm going to call C, and it, it should be like polynomial. Um, and this is going to be an upper bound on the maximum derivative of uh, uh, Hamiltonian, um, the normal derivative, or S. But it's also going to have the upper bound, the maximum second derivative. So like, if you look at this example, I mean, the second derivative vanishes and the first derivative is proportional to HP minus HB, and so it's clear that you can just upper bound the norm of each of HP and HP using the triangle inequality using the norm of each term. So this is only on a small number of terms. In almost any example you can think of, this will be polynomial, and that's not something to worry about. I'll show you how it depends on C, but um, this is not really uh, important for now. The second quantity, which is more important, is uh, the following. It's the minimum spectral gap of the Hamiltonian. <clears throat> so this is the difference between the second largest energy minus the ground energy. And now we're looking at the minimum over the whole path. Okay, so if we draw a picture, here we have like energy. Here we have S, and maybe the ground energy lambda zero looks like this, and the first excited energy maybe looks like this, lambda one, and you have some minimum gap here, and that's G min, and okay, that's the thing that we care about. All right. So now let me uh, let me state the theorem. This is just a special case of their theorem. You know, and you can look to their paper for the more general statement. So remember that we're letting for you know our Hamiltonian has that form, it has two continuous derivatives, or whatever the statement is in the paper that I forget, and then write down. And we're letting S be T over capital T for some capital T. And we're starting in uh, alpha zero of S, which is the ground state, sorry, alpha zero of zero, which is the ground state at time T to zero. And what the theorem says is that if we look at the state developed under the Schroeder equation for time T equals S times capital T, then that will approximate, that will have overlap with the state that we want, the ground state at 
at, uh, at, at that, which is at least 1 minus um, c to the 4 over t squared so this is a special case of the theorem in this paper. And what this says, what is the implication for T? If we want this overlap to be large, so this, this actually <laughs> gives us a little bit more than, than we want, right? Because it says at all times you're going to be close to the ground state. We only really care about being close to the ground state at S equals 1 at the end point, right? So we take S equals 1 here, it says, at the end of the evolution, you have large overlap with the ground state of H of 1, which is the one that we, is computationally useful to us, which we're going to measure and get the answer to the problem. But the, the theorem applies to all S. And what does it say? It says that we have to take T to be, um, to be uh, like, an order of the, let's say we take T to be C squared over G min Q. And that would be sufficient to make this, uh, let's say, a small part. Uh, that will make this quantity a small quantity so that the overlap is large. Okay. Um, so this is this is how big T needs to be, which is um, you know actually this is sort of counterintuitive and counter to what is written in some physics books. In physics books, in at least one physics book, the exponent here is two, and um, I think in many cases if you look at the um, the bound proof to this paper you can get to out of it. But in the worst case, I don't think it is possible to prove the bound of two. Um, so there is sort of this, um, you know, there are statements like in the book of uh, Messiah and quantum mechanics that, that have an exponent two, but I would do that as not Yeah. Does it make sense to look at units? I'm kind of getting confused looking at it. G-man has energy has good units of energy for dimensions of energy. Uh, yeah. Well, I think we've thrown away some like H bars. And, uh, <laughs> so, but can you get any information? Um. Well, okay. I, I'm. I haven't done that, so I'm not sure how that would go. But uh, you know, this is what happens if you just run through the math in the paper. Okay, so what it says is like, I mean, I said C is going to be polynomial in general in cases that we care about sort of easier to prove upper bounds on C. And the difficult thing is understanding um, how big this gap is. Because what happens, imagine that the gap becomes exponentially small at some point along the path. Then what this says is that the runtime you need for the adiabatic approximation to be true is exponential, right? So what it says is that this is an efficient algorithm, sort of modulo the C being polynomial. If C is polynomial, this is an efficient algorithm if and only if this gap is uh, inverse, at, at worst, inverse polynomial. At least, you know, that means it's at least inverse polynomial. It should be a big gap if it's a fast algorithm. Okay? Now this is kind of an analog of like, you should think of the gap as kind of an analog of like the gap of a Markov chain. You know, which determines mixing the Markov chain. So if you imagine like slowly varying Markov chains, this is kind of an analog of like that. Um, uh, this gap is, a, you know, I said it was well studied. So this is a significant parameter in kinetic matter physics because, you know, if we think of this Hamiltonian as describing some physical system, then it's kind of like the lore in kinetic matter physics. I mean, Terms that come from you know, physical mm -hmm. systems. What happens when the gap gets small? Does somebody, does somebody, like if I have a system and I change the parameter and the gap gets small, and then I go past that, what have I done? Well, I would say you've gone through a phase transition. So the closing of a gap is in physics associated with phase transition. And so like on this side you're doing one gap phase, and on the other side you're doing another gap phase, and the gap closes in between. Now whether or not that interpretation is really accurate for these systems where you have encoded some computational problem in the Hamiltonian is up for debate. I mean, you know, that's where the intuition comes from systems with a lot of structure that is not present in these, these systems. 
And you know, understanding this gap and understanding like when phase transitions occur is already difficult in the presence of many symmetries, translation variants, and shooting lattices, the presence of all this nice stuff that structure that helps you in transmatter physics, understanding gaps is already difficult. So even in 1D systems, there are conjectures about gaps that are unresolved for, for um, decades. So, so you can imagine that you know when you try to study these more complicated like systems where you have basically a spin glass, like the CSP example, and then you add on to it quantum transverse field, then understanding the scaling of this spectral gap with respect to the system size is very challenging. And so that's why we don't really have a good understanding of the runtime of this algorithm. Um, you cannot go a uh, number of um, number of um, no. the gap that you're seeing in your life. Uh, it's not a useful up or down. Yeah, it makes no sense. No. Okay. Um, let me mention a couple of things. So this, I've sort of presented, uh, you can think of it as a model of quantum computing. So I agree. Okay. So you can think of this as a model of quantum computing, or you can think of it as an algorithm, as a framework for designing algorithms that can then be implemented in the, in, the, uh, in the standard model. If you do want to think about it as a model of quantum computing, there is one very important caveat, which is that there is currently no uh, notion of fault tolerance in this model. In the standard circuit model of quantum computing, there is a well-developed theory of quantum error correction and fault tolerance, which means, which we haven't talked about in this course yet. But it will. Right, we can talk about it soon. And what it means is that you can, even in the presence of faulty components, compute arbitrarily well by redundantly encoding information. That's that's why we believe that quantum computers can be, one of the reasons we believe quantum computers can be realized in the real world where things are not perfect. But in the adiabatic model, there is not, it's a major open question to develop the theory of fault tolerance. So that's one reason maybe against considering it as a model of quantum computation that can be realized. Um, I should also comment that I used the term adiabatic quantum computing, which was uh, in this paper by Tari Gilstone. Sensor, but recently it has become more common to call this quantum annealing. And actually, I think there is a slight difference in what is meant by the two, because, well, I guess there are some commercial ventures that produce machines that are claimed to contain quantum annealing. And I think sometimes what that means is that it's a version of this adiabatic quantum computing, which is subject to noise. I think sometimes it has that interpretation. Um, so just watch out for that. Okay. Um, oh, one, uh, so Eddie Barry was my PhD advisor, and one thing he told me when I was getting, you know, I worked on some of these things when I was in graduate school, and one thing he told me, which stuck with me, which I think is kind of interesting, is like, in examples like this, you can't even prove that the gap goes to zero at all. So like here we're trying to say, well, the gap has to be at least inverse polynomial. Right? So, you know, we want to show it's like at least one for poly n. But you can't even show here that the gap goes to zero. Like, you couldn't, you know, for all we know, it could be a constant as a function of that. So that's kind of like, it shows you the, the, how bad the bounds are. Yeah? Maybe this is a big, are there any examples of HB and HP where the straight line homotopy thing has a very small gap, but if you went some other way, you have oh. to uh, probably. I, I don't know one off the top of my head. I mean, this is, actually, there are a number of examples that have special structure and have been studied, but really none of them capture what's going on in this example because here you have this like big, you know you have this problem, this constraint satisfaction problem that has like it's structured according to these clauses, and the examples where you can solve exactly what's going on, you know, just don't have the same flavor. Okay, so let me um, move to the last part of the talk, where I want to discuss the, uh, the, uh, the universality of this model. Unless there are further questions. Okay, all right.
very, this is the journal version, right? So, yeah, it was 2004. 
there. So when I recognize the ingredients from the circuit times I'm mapping so earlier, actually not all of them. If you remember before there was an HN, there was an H prop, and then there was an H pouch. And we're not gonna have the H out. Okay? We're gonna have the H in, we're gonna have the H prop, and then we're gonna have this extra term. Okay? And this H in is gonna be present throughout the whole Hamiltonian path. And this guy's gonna get turned off and the H prop term will get turned off. And let me just write down uh, the form of these terms. Okay. So here, my notation is that the tensor product always separates the data register from the clock register. Okay? This is the one projector on the i qubit of the data register. So that's H in and H prop T. Okay, so this is um, very similar to what you saw earlier, except for we have this in terms of the closing. What is the input? Yeah, the other thing. Oh, the other thing is XI, which is the one that makes you the number of lines. Oh, yeah, because because the circuit acts on all zero. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's a few slight differences like that. Um, okay, so um, let's just, you know, Let's figure out whether or not this, this is going to work. So first we need to look at the ground states of the beginning Hamiltonian of age of zero and the ground state of age of one and see whether or not age of zero is easy to compare and age of one gives us the solution to the really gives us the output of the function. Okay. So What's the ground state of H of zero? You can tell me. So when S is zero, this goes away and this is a coefficient of one. So what's, what's it going to be? What's that? H in plus zero. Well, the Hamiltonian, yeah, is going to be this plus that. And so this, this gives an energy penalty to anything except zero on the second register. And and, and this says that if you're in zero on the second register, you have to be in zero on the first register. So I claim that the ground state is going to be zero times n on the first register, and then zero on the second register. Okay? Is that all right? Okay. Um, okay, so now let's look at the ground state of H1. So when this is one, this term goes away. And we have H in plus H this H prop term. Okay? So this is exactly the same as the Hamiltonian and the circuit Hamiltonian mapping we saw before without H out. So we don't have a penalty that says you have to be an accepting, you know, you have to have be an input that accepts the computation. But I claim that um, well, it's an easy computation to see that. The ground state of H of 1 is this history state starting with all zeros. Okay? So that's the, uh, the history state. And the the fact that we don't have an H out term just means that 
um, that uh, we're not selecting for uh, input that forces the circuit to accept. Um, okay, now we could compute, there's two other things we need to compute, right, to see whether or not, so now we know that like if we run this adiabatic on computation, starting in this state and we go slow enough, then we'll end up in this state, which is the output of the quantum circuit, and then we can, actually it's not quite the output of the quantum circuit, right? it's the history state. So then what, what do we do? Well, we can measure the second register, and if we get t equals m, then we've got what we want, right? So that happens with probability what? Plus one plus one. One over m plus one, right? So we could just run this like m plus one times the right. There's other ways to make it so you only have to run it once, but it's not so important. Okay, so so this if you measure this state, it's sort of enough to 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 simulate this uh, quantum computation. Okay, so now all we have to do to show is we have to show that this is an efficient algorithm in the adiabatic model, which means we need to show an upper bound on the norm of the first two derivatives of the Hamiltonian, as well as a lower bound on the spectral gap. Um, I mean, the upper bound on the norm is like completely trivial in this case. So the the second derivative is zero. The first derivative um, well, you know, it's, it's, it's this term minus that term. And each of these is a projector. Each of these is a prop of key, and this is also a projector. And so the norm of that is upper bounded by a triangle inequality. Um, by m plus one, uh, m plus two. Well, anyways, it's okay. Okay, so now all we have to do is check that the spectral gap is lower bounded by an inverse polynomial function of m and m state. Okay, so now So um, the way that we're going to do that is we're going to use this special unitary that when you rotate by this unitary, it gets rid of the, um, the use. Okay? So remember from Dorit's lecture that there is a unitary which, a global unitary which when you conjugate this h prop of t by that unitary, the u's go away and get replaced by the u. Right? So let me write that out. So now we can look at R H of S R. Obviously, since this is unitary, when we conjugate the Hamiltonian, the spectral gap is invariant. So we could just as well the spectral gap of this conjugated unitary. And this thing is equal to um, yeah. I mean, okay. I guess I'll write it all out again, but. Yeah, that's the Hamilton. Maybe I can just write that because writing out this expression again might be a little bit. Uh, yeah, so, so maybe I'll write it as like H with U of S is H with identity of S. Is that okay? So what this means is everywhere there's there's a gate, you replace it with the identity. Okay? Is that clear what this means? Okay. So so now we were just left with computing the spectral gap of the thing where u is replaced by the identity. So let me actually just, um, is it okay if I erase this and just replace it by the identity over here? Okay, so now, um, it's still true by the way that um, this is the ground state when you have all the u being identity, but of course now these get replaced by identity, so it's fun to change it. One thing I want to observe here is that this H in, I mean, the whole thing leaves the subspace where the, 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 the if I take the subspace for this, the, um, the subspace where the first register is in all zeros is left invariant by this Hamilton. Okay? So since I'm starting in that subspace and I'm evolving with this Hamiltonian, I never leave that subspace. 
And so I can, without loss of generality, look at the speckle gap within that substrate. Where the initial state, the first register is null zero. Because I'm considering the case where all the user identities, right? Yeah, so the, the first register never leaves the all zero substrate. It just stands by that one state. It's always in that state. So I can just look at the restriction of this Hamiltonian to that subspace. And in that subspace, um, this term is zero. Okay, so that's that's all I want to do, is just say now I can, for the purposes of computing the spectral gap, I can just instead of this, now look at this Hamiltonian. Okay, to compute the spectral gap, where H prop is given by this, where I replace the identity. Okay? But now let's look at this Hamiltonian. So um, Everything acts as the identity on the first register. There's nothing that acts on the first register. Everything acts only non-trivially on the second register, which is this register for the plot. Okay? So the whole Hamiltonian now, let me write it out over here. So this thing, if I restrict to this subspace, so let's call the subspace L, If I restrict to that space, then what it looks like is 1 minus s, um, and then I have identity on the first register. Okay, let me write the whole thing as identity on the first register, tensor, and then I have 1 minus s. And now I'm going to write it as just a m by m, or m plus 1 by m plus 1 matrix, okay, on the second register. So this first term looks like uh, 0 on the 0 state and 1 is everywhere else. And the second term is this uh, Laplacian matrix for the half of the graph. It's related to the room one. Okay, so obviously the spectral gap with this is just the spectral gap with the thing in the, in the square parentheses. And you know, this is the Laplacian of a path of length m, m plus 1. And it's known that if you just look at this term, so this you know, the Laplacian matrix of the path, and the gap of that, if I just look at this, the gap of this is well known to be order 1 over m squared. Um, and, you know, this is like very, I mean, it's not hard to imagine that you could analyze what happens when you have this matrix. You know, this matrix is very simple, and this, the, the sort of key here is that this whole matrix is independent of the circuit that we want to simulate. And so, to understand the scaling of the spectral gap, you just need to understand this one matrix that's very closely related to the Laplacian and the path. And so, um, in, in their paper, they prove that the gap of this matrix, I'm not going to prove it because it would add a lot of um, technicalities, but the, um, so the, the gap of this matrix is um, uh, and so what that shows is that since we have a inverse polynomial lower bound on the gap, and we have a polynomial upper bound on the norm of the first and second derivatives, this gives us a polynomial runtime for the adiabatic algorithm applied, you know, applied to this Hamiltonian, which lets us simulate uh, the circuit that we started with. So this shows that not only can on the computer to simulate the adiabatic, the adiabatic model, but the adiabatic model can simulate numerous points. Now, there's more caveats here, which is um, related to what I mentioned earlier, which is that, you know, sometimes this is sort of quoted as evidence that, you know, this is a good model to realize in the real world, that it's universal and so. But I already mentioned that, you know, it's not known to have false arms. So that is. You know, one drawback. How come? Is this for the other one? Is it more than the infinite of the data? 
Um, no, because, well, the fault tolerance in the circuit model is not exactly, it doesn't line up with what you want for fault tolerance in this model. Um, yeah. Like a noise model here would not be the same as a noise model in the circuit model. Um, yeah. <coughs> For example, if you, if you just as a first answer, if you have a few full common circuits and then you do the exact construction, then your gates, I will talk about full columns later on, but your, your fault tolerance gates sit only in the computation register, and your clock register is not protected at all. Yeah, but let me mention, like, one other thing is that oftentimes when people talk about adiabatic algorithms, they really are talking about adiabatic optimization algorithms, like algorithms for CSPs. And we really don't have any examples where that outperforms classical. And there have been numerical studies of Adiabatic algorithms on CSPs, which so using these probabilistic methods that I mentioned earlier. So there's a whole story, which is that you have this universal adiabatic construction, which means that general local Hamiltonians are capable of universal computation. But then there's like a subclass of Hamiltonians called Plastic that we'll talk about on Thursday, which most of the optimization algorithms fall into that category. And that category of Hamiltonians is unlikely to be universal when you use for adiabatic quantum computation for complexity theoretic reasons that we'll talk about on Thursday. And it might even be that that class of Hamiltonians is classically assimilable in public domain. So I think it's important to be careful about you know, when we talk about adiabatic algorithms, it's like it's a very broad set of things, and we know that you can, you know, you can do universal quantum computing, but we also know that. Um, from any specific proposals, it's less likely to be powerful. And um, finally, like, it is kind of frustrating that it seems like a very natural model. And many people have imagined interesting things you could do in this model. But we are sort of incapable of proving these balance on the spectral gap in general. And so it's a major open question to come up with examples um, of interesting, you know, of algorithms that you really design in this model that beat the best classical algorithm. Um, and uh, I, I don't think we really have an example of that. The, the one, one example which I think we do have is uh, people using adiabatic state preparation um, as the starting point for other algorithms. So, for example, in the uh, uh, Pressville, uh, Pressville Jordan and Lee paper, for, um, this is an algorithm for simulating the scattering of quantum field theories. Um, the first step of that algorithm is to use adiabatic state preparation to prepare some initial state. Um, and there's another example of that in the algorithm proposed by um, Bella Bauer and Mark Sockley for simulating the materials. Although in that, in that case, the time is not as long. Um, okay, so I guess we'll end a few minutes early. Let's <coughs> that's, that's pause for questions. Yes? Uh, so so the, uh, the bound for the both time, one of the parameters was the, um, the norm of the first two years. Yes. So, um, you know, um, a lot of these uh, are possible for both of them. There is a control theory. You got kind of a um, not smooth control function. Like, the main method. Yeah. Um, so is there a balance? You use the well, actually, that's a good point. So, so, well, here we're really in the opposite limit because we're talking about adiabatic slow chain, right? So it's somehow like this limit kind of Abrupt change that you're talking about the opposite. That limit is actually interesting. Um, well, of course it's interesting, but there are proposals to sort of. Um, so, something we're going to talk about tomorrow is this was another proposal of Hardy and Goldstone and Gutman, which can be viewed as like taking a, a, a bang bang version of the impact algorithm, building a few things. And that, um, has some interesting features that are not shared by the computer center.